So good evening and uh, welcome to the International Ocean Film Festival. My name is Anna Blanco and I'm the executive director of the festival. And it's my honor and my privilege to welcome everyone to our Q&A today for our Atoll Speaks. We have an illustrious group of uh, panelists today and we're very excited to have everyone on our live feed as well. Thank you for joining us. Um, before we get into our panel discussion, I do want to just say a few words about the film festival. And first and foremost, thank you so much to this group of individuals who have created such an amazing film. We have had a spectacular group of films this year from all over the world, um, each telling its own unique story and telling us about how we can all become better ocean stewards, about what we can do to protect our ocean, taking us around the world uh, with story after story. And we are thrilled to be able to bring the festival to everyone uh, via a virtual online platform. It's new for us. Um, it's been exciting. We have had so many people um, uh, appreciate the opportunity to not only experience the films, but to be a part of the Q&A. So um, thank you all for being here and for making the time and the prep work that goes into doing this. The films are available online. And just today, I don't know if any of you heard about it, but we announced that we've extended the virtual film festival by another week. So the end date is now Sunday, August 16th, which gives everybody more time to watch the films, to watch the recorded Q and A's. Um, the emails are pouring in with gratitude to just have more time because we are, even though most of us are quarantined at home, we're all very, very busy. So um, please share the festival with your friends and let people know that this Q and A will be available as soon as we're done um, and it'll be available on our website. So. Um, thank you for helping us to support our mission, which is saving our oceans one film at a time. So before I get started, we have a guest who is joining us from Puka Puka. Let's let him in and give him a big, big welcome to Pio Rabaua. Let's see. How exciting. <laughs> this is epic. Oh, he's, he was patiently waiting for us, so, oh, here he comes. <laughs> Let's give him a minute. He's, he can hear us, and he's trying to connect with us. It's okay. There you go. Yeah, yeah, here I am. Yeah. <laughs> Yay! Welcome, Pio. Welcome. Que hola, Pio. <laughs> Amazing. We're so excited to have you join us. My name's Anna. I'm with the Ocean Film Festival, and it's my honor to welcome you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Loud and clear. Loud and clear. Fantastic. Well. You are amongst an amazing group of women, which I think you will probably already know that, um, but we are so excited to have you join us for this Q&A. And uh, we're recording, and we have a lot of people online who are watching live, so everyone's gonna have a chance to ask a question afterwards. So thank you all for being here. Really appreciate it. I'm going to start with um, giving an intro to our uh, moderator, Nicole Esters. Nicole, you want to raise your hand? Hi. Uh, Nicole is joining us from Oakland. And let me tell you a little bit about why we're so lucky to have Nicole moderating our Q&A today. Um, she's a new friend to the festival. And she is an environmental conservation practitioner focusing on our global ocean. She has a background in international relations, governance, and policy, and she works in the space between sustainable natural resource management, conservation, and economic development to protect important ecosystems and the services they provide. Nicole has spent the last 15 years with Conservation International, which I think most of our viewers have heard of, uh, working around the world and is now currently a senior director of development. 
After nine years of being in Honolulu, Hawaii and working across the Asia Pacific region, Nicole recently relocated to Oakland, California to provide support to more than 30 countries where Conservation International and its partners operate. So we are very lucky to have you and welcome to Nicole. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. It's, it's, uh, it's wonderful to, to be here and to join everyone. And thank you. I'm so happy and honored to, to be asked to moderate this, this panel and, and this Q&A session on the film, Our Atoll Speaks. It's a beautiful, wonderful film. And I was just so personally moved by it. So I was getting more and more excited as, we, as this buildup came. Um, but before we get into the questions, uh, let's start with introducing our panelists. Um, so first up, we have Florence uh, Johnny Frisbee, better known as Johnny, who was uh, who was born in. I don't actually. I don't want to give you. I'm I'm I'm, uh, I'm going to be respectful and, <laughs> and say and say that um, that she is a renowned Cook Islands uh, woman and leader, well known throughout the world um, as a published author at at the age of fifteen. Um, the first, when, the, uh, she, when she first published her, her autobiography, uh, Miss Ulysses from Puka Puka, which yeah. is uh, available for, for your enjoyment on Amazon. Um, the book describes her life growing up um, on Puka Puka and, is, and uh, she's also a children's writer and her books have been translated into many Pacific Island languages. Um, Amelia Hokulea Borowski is a co-producer and co-writer. Um, having grown up in the islands, Dr. Borofsky is, a passion, is passionate about the strengths of island communities. She started Sea, islands, sea of Islands Consulting to bring her networks, research, expertise, writing skills, and commitment to service together. She's trained as a clinical psychologist and she received an, the, an American Psychological Association Minority Fellowship for her research and clinical service with diverse populations. I want to mention that because I want to highlight that her her uh, her commitment and her um, long-standing relationship with uh, youth and schools and education. Her dissertation was a mixed method message methods program evaluation of alumni of Native Hawaiian public charter schools, and she developed the Native Hawaiian Leadership Scale and is an active in cultural strengthening program value based program evaluations. Um, Mr. Pio Rabarua. Hello, <laughs> welcome, sir. Um, is from the Puka Puka People's Fund. Pio is the executive officer for the Puka Pukan uh, local island government, and also holds a traditional uh, chief's title for Nakake Village in Puka Puka. Pio has been instrumental in facilitating and coordinating access to the villages and people of Puka Puka. And, and last but certainly not least, <laughs> um, the the film's director, producer, and camerawoman. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Hema Cubero de Barrio. Um, Hema was born in Spain, but has been living uh, in the United States for more than 20, for more than 20 years. She was trained as a, as, a, as a journalist and has a passion for nonfiction storytelling. Um, during, the, during the 20 years, she has worked in documentary films. She has made films in Spain, the United States, Mexico, Cuba, Germany, Argentina, Hawaii, and Cook Islands. So she is passionate about her work, and we and uh, and it shines through in this in this film. So I'm going to start with with you, Emma. Um, how did the film emerge? How how did you settle on this particular story? Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Nicole. And um, I just want to say this is such a treat to have these beautiful people here. This film emerged because uh, for the last eight years, I've been working on a documentary feature about Amelia and Johnny, actually, and their relationship to Puka Puka. So I planned this film like I've planned others. This film emerged from making the feature length that has been titled Homecoming for a long time. And that is still in the works and is almost finished. Um, in 2015, we were able, all of us together, to do a very uh, successful Kickstarter campaign and get funding from people such as like Pacific Islanders in Communications to go and do this feature length. And we started filming and um, I was really blown away by the beauty and the wealth 
of the Pukapukan people and culture. And I realized that I needed to go back that five weeks to make a film was not enough or not even to capture this amazing place. So in 2017, um, I went back with Amelia to capture more footage. And by then, um, Amelia was living in the Cook Islands and she was able, we were able to secure a grant from the UNDP, uh, a small grants program that is a fund um, that is uh, managed by the Red Cross in the Cook Islands. And um, that's, um, and then this fund said, well, you funding to support so you guys can go back to Puka Puka, but you need to do a film that is to climate change. And that's all they said. And I knew that I needed to come up with a deliverable. At that time, it was just something that I needed to turn in, like a five minute, right, Amelia? Three to five minute piece. And we lived there for five to six months in the Cook Islands. And when I came back, uh, we, um, I was working with my editor, Kion Lee, that I want to thank because she's watching. And I, we were aware that we have so much footage about this place that uh, we realized we could make a separate film, this other film, our Atlas Books. They decided the knowledge that Puka Puka had in Europe. So that's how it em emerged. But it was never planned to be like what it is. You know, it just, I'm very happy that what you see in the film just emerged from the process of doing the film with the community, with the people. It so it sounds, it sounds really organic. It sounds really, you know, like it just kind of grew and evolved as you yourselves went on this personal journey. And it really does shine through. I mean, for me, the, the most beautiful part about it was the narration. Um, it's so wonderful. It's calming. It just kind of, when it ended, I was, I, I have a roommate and I turned to her and I said, so this is what I miss about living in the Pacific. <laughs> you know, this is why, you know, and she goes, yeah. And I said, yeah, that right there. Perfect. Perfect and example. Beautiful voice of, of Johnny, right? <laughs> so yeah. So Johnny and Amelia, how did you craft such a beautiful script that at the same time with its message of food security and the message of climate change also is powerful and really substantive. It has a, you know, a powerful message for people to sit, to sit up and take note of. Um, it was a, a total surprise um, at the time I was approached by Amelia and Hema. They came to the house and it was a, a surprise. And um, I was very moved um, because I was be beginning to get homesick uh, for Puka Puka, but there was no way, uh, no way I could um, afford to go to Puka Puka at that time. Um, and then we, we talked about uh, the possibility of going to Puka Puka and filming um, Homecoming. You know, I was just on top of the world. It was a beautiful gift, beautiful gift at this point in my life. But thank you, Amelia and Emma. <laughs> and Amelia? Um, so the, the poetry and pacing comes from Johnny Frisbee's erotic voice and her storytelling. And I think it comes from listening to stories growing up in Puka Puka. It's very visual when you're sitting around listening to stories and legends. And it came in part from um, my background as a qualitative researcher. So Hema had hundreds of interviews um, from over the years. So I began to look through all the interviews and highlight everywhere that someone had talked about food security and conservation and took it all together and made it into a narrative poem. So all the words come from people living on the island and everyone on the atoll speaks very visually and poetically. So I think that's where that comes for and uses a lot of metaphor and different, um, just rich language. And being able to take all everyone's words and make it one voice. So as if the atoll is actually speaking. And then the opening is from the legend. Um. Oh. 
oh no <laughs> we lost we lost amelia so mm -hmm. uh, we we will we will wait for her to well we, we'll let her obviously try to come back on um Thank but you. i'm i'm gonna um i'm gonna actually shift gears a little bit um to mr pio um you know how does it feel to to share puka puka's story its origin it's you know it's it's uh environment it's it's feeling with you know a global audience who are for many for most people including myself just you know discovering this wonderful place for the first time well to me it feels amazing uh what this project has done for and the fact that it is out there globally for us uh, a little known island um, through this medium, it is it is amazing. It is amazing. Uh, well, I'm proud. I'm proud of what these women, their efforts in, in, in what they've done with this project. Um, there is a feature, full feature documentary on the way, and part of that journey is, as they've already said, as I was saying. Uh, they were able to produce um, some of the material that was filmed through this uh, short film. So it's, uh, to me, as a native of Puka Puka, I'm really proud and glad uh, of, of their efforts uh, in producing this. And it is fantastic and it's amazing for me to look at this and, and and the wow factor is there to, to, to imagine, to think that globally we are right, right up there. And the many accolades this film has brought, it's, it's quite amazing. Thank you very much for, on behalf of the people of Pukabu. Thank you. Wonderful. All right, so. Um, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have a, I have another question for you, so, but I'll give you, but I'll give you a, a bit of a, a break as I, as I move on <laughs> to some of these other ladies, these other wonderful women. Um, so Amelia, I know we kind of got cut off in your, in your, and your, uh, your answer for the previous question, but I found the, 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 the fact that you said a poem and poetry really, really amazing because it does shine through in the narration. You know, with your, with your background in, in education, you know, one of the last things in the film is you know a note about youth connecting to the environment. Um, knowledge and tradition is mentioned throughout the film. You know, uh, and and um, how do you see your work? And how do you see that kind of being advanced and move forward with this film? Hmm. Thank you for that question. That's a great question. Um, you know, what I learned about climate change in Puka Puka is that it's really about conservation and connection and that the youth um, are connected to the land and to their sense of place and preserving that connection for the next seven generations. And what I saw there just blew me away, um, but not everyone on the island, especially the youth were always valuing how much rich knowledge there was. So, you know, Justin Bieber and Beyonce on the cell phones was, you know, sometimes more exciting than going to catch a coconut crab or, watching the full moon for the reef fish. And just a reminder that this knowledge is so rich and to honor it and respect it and, and make it sexy to connect to the land and to connect to our sense of place. And that can be done anywhere in the world, not just in Puka Puka, we all have a sense of place to connect to. And that's where the education piece you know, comes in of finding our sense of place. Puka Puka and Puka Pukans have such a strong sense of place, um, but we all have that potential. And then connecting to that environment and getting to know it and responding to it, that's what climate change and conservation is about. It's about knowing your environment and then responding to it. So um, it was such a huge lesson for me, you know, having spent so much time doing book learning, you know, for the first time in my life, I, I caught my own meal all with my hands and I'd never done that and to me it was just revolutionary and to everyone else it was just everyday life and so to really elevate respect and 
yeah, make it appealing and sexy to the younger generation. It's part of the, the mission. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And, and Johnny, you know, um, you know, as someone who has been telling the story of Puka Puka for, for since you were a child yourself, how are you feeling at, about how, how this film, you know, continues this legacy of storytelling and, and for your home? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, there, are, there are changes um, since I lived on Puka Puka, uh, changes from the time I was, you know, uh, a little girl. And um, I have, I did return in 1961, uh, but since 1961 to 2015, there, there is a big change. Um, there is a little bit of television here and there and uh, cell phone. And many of the, uh, many of uh, the Puka Pukans have traveled to New Zealand and Australia. And when they do leave for those two places, uh, it's not for months or two months, it's a waste of time. It's, you know, for a year or two years sometimes, three years, and then they return to Puka Puka and they've uh, come back um, uh, a little slightly changed in there because they've learned so much in a place like Australia, traffic, big theater, the restaurants, many, many things. And there is that, um, uh, slight change in the Puka Pukans, you know, but they're still uh, beautiful, you know, their hearts, you know, just full of love and they're very polite and kind and always offering, would you like a coconut? Are you thirsty? I'll climb like the boys, I'll climb up a coconut tree to fetch you a coconut, you know, those, those, those still remain, that hospitality that's just unbelievable. Um, yes, um, Mm -hmm. For now, that's all I can say. <laughs> okay, and along those same lines of you know how how the island and the atoll functions, you know the one of the key messages in the film that I saw was you know it's a it's a communal society and where mm -hmm. you know group dis group dis mm -hmm. decisions are made you know for conservation for st sustainable management. Mr. Mm -hmm. Pio, would you kind of give us your your experience with that and and how that come how, how that goes continues on over the years and, and how you've been able to maintain that as, as an atoll community. Yes, well, uh, thank you for that question. Um, as, a, as an atoll community, um, everybody basically knows everybody. From the, from the newest child to the island and to the oldest person, to the wall. And um, this is how we maintain that uh, communal society, that everybody has a concern for each other. Nobody wants to have uh, to know their grandparent has been uh, left alone or deserted or nor a child uh, at, at risk uh, swimming in the, on the beach. Those sort of things, the community, uh, because of the smallness of the population, I guess, where everybody knows everybody and nobody wants uh, putting everybody at risk. So this communal spirit is instilled in, in the Puka Puka and psyche to look after each other caring for each other. And I think that's, that's the, I'm sure there are other places in the world like that, but it is basically because there was a small population. Uh, it may not work for bigger populations where you don't really know everybody on the island or wherever it is. So there is kind of distance, concern for their well-being. But for us on Puka Puka, everybody basically knows everybody. So we're yeah, caring and working together for the good of, of everybody. That's the main goal and living and being happy, being peaceful. That's why it works for us. Wonderful. Absolutely. I wish, I wish everyone has that, has that kind of outlook, you know, you know, Hema, um, 
as a as a filmmaker, you know, your 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 role is to capture all of these stories from around the world. How do you then work to transport this type of spirit, this type of you know caring among amongst your family and your neighbors to others? To how do you how do you use these platforms um, to transfer that kind of spirit through your your art? Uh, well, um, that is the beauty of film, right? that it has a language that no matter where you are in the world, uh, we all have emotions, no matter what language we speak. And for me, it was really important to be immersed in the culture, to be able to experience it. It was not a place that you could show, just go in quick, quick, quick and go out. So um, I think what um, my editor and I were able to accomplish was to really capture the beauty of place visually, but also this meditative quality that, um, that I, I did feel also in Puka Puka. And this deep uh, sense of respect that I, and sophistication that I also saw in the Puka Puka culture and people. So um, I wanna thank I actually, one thing that I didn't mention is that we work with the school. We did a storytelling workshops and I work with Cole Tinga, that is one of the art teachers that was, had been shooting uh, with drones and underwater. He's a, an amazing fisherman. So once I got there and saw his footage, which is so stunning, you know, that I was like, oh my God, I could not even film that because I'm not a fisherman. So he, it was just incredible. So, and then I work also, we work with Seve Tanga also, he helped me with sound and stuff. So this is the beauty of film, right? I wanted to make sure that it was a film that was done with an entire community. If you look, if you watch the film, when you watch the film, take a look at the credits. We made the intention, it was this, everything has been very intentional to really include everybody there. And then use the language of cinema, right? The visual, the sound, the beautiful editing. It doesn't come, drones are great drones, but it's how you edit it, <laughs> you know? And also the sound, and it was important, I think, for all of us to include the language. So if you don't know where Puka Puka is in the world, uh, you're gonna learn about this through this film, but also I wanted people to hear the language. And that's why we were so blessed to have Johnny also be able to do the narration and include here and there the poetry of the language that is really unique to, to Puka Puka, right, Pio and Johnny? So to include all these ingredients so when you're watching it, you're just so taken by it that you will remember it and maybe you will wanna do something in your community. I mean, not everybody has the luxury of living in such an amazing place, but hopefully it will inspire you to really, uh, do something in your community about conservation, about adaptation. Well, with that in mind, I, I would I would love to hear from all of you all what you would what you are taking from this experience and being a part of this film, being you know making it, narrating it, you know having it having it set up shop in your home. Uh, what are you What are you uh, feeling and planning on taking forward? And I'll start with you, Johnny. Oh, um... <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, I, I've been around, I've visited other islands in the Pacific and, um, and I've seen the change, there, there has to be change uh, because there we have airports and plane coming in and bringing tourists from all over the world. So um, the people, local people accommodate them. They make, want to make sure that they're comfortable, that there has to be changes, you know. And, uh, and so uh, I, was, I was very happy that the change on Puka Puka is not so severe that it's absorbed, you know, a lot of the customs and definitely the language is still so beautiful and um, intact. Well, there are some Rarotongan words here and there, but um, the older people speak that language and they speak it in a way and it's almost like you're chanting that, um, when they talk to you, it's beautiful. Um, the changes are minor and um, it's, it's, it's good because Puka Puka can't just 
be protected. Uh, the beauty of it, the language, the people can, and the world, move, you know, world moves on, and they, they need to also pick up here and there what is best for them on an at all without destroying completely the, the, uh, the, the heart of the place. And uh, that, is, that is the way it is. And luckily, luckily, Puka Puka is very far away. It's so it's not <laughs> it's hard to reach. It's, it's not easy to reach. And now it is because it's an airstrip in the plane. Uh, and that has been, um, um, uh, it's, uh, it's really what um, um, helped Puka Puka uh, remain more or less intact in, in, um, in, in its own in its own way. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Pio, what are you, what are you uh, looking at taking forward from this experience? Oh, I think you're- Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm just blown away by the project itself. But uh, what, what I can take away from, as uh, Auntie J Johnny was saying, um, I choose the isolation in one way because we don't want our culture to, with uh, uh, tourists, with too many tourists coming in and Oh, I think we might be having connectivity issues. Might be a bit of a delay. Is he frozen on everyone else's screen as well? Yes, okay. Yes. Okay. We'll come back hopefully. Yes, we'll come back. So um, we will move on to Amelia, your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I take a lot forward from the experience of making the film and working on the film and sharing it and hopefully taking it um, to more schools and youth all over the world. One of the biggest things I take is, you know, when I read a lot about climate change, it was all these uh, very dire narratives. And what I learned from Puka Puka and the experience of making this film about climate change is more of an empowerment model that um, when you're connected and understand and know how to conserve you're able to adapt to the climate. And, you know, Puka Puka is like most Polynesians and most indigenous communities around the world are the original creators of food security because you had to know food security in order to survive. So I'm reading all these UN guidelines and, you know, kind of climate change talk about food security. And I'm like, well, this is food security. It's a very elegant, incredibly sophisticated system of rotating motus and making sure, you know, everybody knows how to conserve in order to survive. So I really learned more of an empowerment narrative and storytelling about um, climate change and conservation, particularly around indigenous communities and elevating the voice and knowledge of indigenous communities who, who live uh, in connection with their natural environment or may have in the past and returning to those ways, which we are doing more in Hawaii as well, and kind of educating youth about that connection and sense of place and the indigenous communities, wherever youth might be living. Great, and, and uh, Pema, when, when you answer this question, I also would like to note and remind everyone that you mentioned that the funding from this came from United Nations De Development Program. And so there is, you know, a connection to the United Nations kind of platforms and mechanisms. So. Um, when you talk about how you think about going forward, can you also kind of talk about that opportunity or, or that, you know, that pathway, if there is such a yes, opportunity? I mean, when, when, I, when, when I knew that we had a, a film, not just like a deliverable, you know, I, I did ask the UN if they, they could give us some time to really, um, the UN in the Cook Islands, I wanna say, uh, if they will give us some time really to take the film to experiment or take the film to festivals. And this, uh, um, we finished it last year and ever since then, in intentionally we premiered at the Wairoa Maori Film Festival in New Zealand. We, the film traveled through New Zealand. Uh, it went also to the Tetuki Airani Film Festival in the Cook Islands, it showed in Cook Islands television, it's gonna go to Guam. So um, 
you know, the film, the world of film is constantly changing. So my, my goal was just to first start with film festivals and then really make the film available. To, oh, well, mm, we also started the process of creating partnerships with uh, NGOs. Um, I'm learning, I'm learning as I go. I'm not an environmentalist. I'm a filmmaker that this film is to be used and to be used for education, to inspire people to, so what I think is coming next is once we complete the festival, you know, uh, festival, uh, the festival circuit is to really, we wanna continue create partnerships, hopefully be able to raise some funds for impact, you know, and just really take it to the schools and that the film travels. And I, I am, we are, because this is a we film, we are very open to just, if you are interested in showing the film in your community, can't reach out to us, you know, we'll make it available so people can download it and all that, you know, but also I think it goes beyond that. I think this film, I hope it travels. I hope it takes it to schools, to NGOs. I hope that organizations like yours, <laughs> Nicole, you know, or many, this is the beauty of this film festival. I'm watching films, I'm like mesmerized about the connection between islands and people and, you know, so that we actually get to use it and that the film is really seen and hopefully it inspires other people to use it in the classrooms and, you know, to make to make on more connections. That's really what I, I hope. And we really need help too, in terms of like ideas, you know, I, I don't know it all, I, of course, you know, and I'm constantly learning. So I really hope that after this festival, we can, you know, do that. Just continue the film travels and, continues to inspire and hopefully to create an impact. So. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Yes, you always want to, I mean, with such a powerful story and a message behind it. And as, as Amelia said, you know, the empowerment of the message of the story of the actual actions and, and um, of, you know, Puka Pukans, you know, that's, that's what you want to, to show, you know, the world is facing a lot of negativity right now across very many different uh, themes and sectors and things like that. So, so a message of positivity and, and a pro, you know, being proactive and, you know, and consistent and respectful and caring of others is, is always, you know, appreciated and th things like that. Um, I, I just want to remind the audience that we would love to have you all um, submit questions. I'm happy to ask these lovely ladies and Mr. Pio once he, uh, once he joins back with us. Um, uh, um, Johnny, uh, uh, Naima, I might be saying this wrong, but I apologize. Naima says, uh, aloha, Auntie Johnny. So I hope, <laughs> I hope that means something to you. <laughs> <laughs> and afterwards you can, you can say hi again to <laughs> as well. Oh, I'm speaking of Mr. Pio. Um, <laughs> okay. There you go. You're back. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so, sorry, that was a bad connection. Uh, signal dropped out. <laughs> bad, bad signal. That's okay. I am I am placed very strategically in my apartment right now to make sure <laughs> that I don't have any technical difficulties. So I complete, and I'm in, and I'm outside of uh, San Francisco. So there is no judgment <laughs> where you are right now. <laughs> so, um, so thank you all. This is not uh, your fault. This is my fault. Oh, uh, just uh... <laughs> technology. <laughs> So, all right, so let me, um, so we've, you know, we've kind of discussed education and the youth and, and kind of amplifying the message. Um, have you all heard from others and as a um, feedback from, from them, you know, from the film, you know, you've, you, you showed it in, in New Zealand and Mr. Pio talked about, you know, some of the feedback already, but I would love to hear and share with some of the, you know, with the audience, some of the different kinds of feedback that, that you're receiving from um, from those who have seen the film and, and the responses. Well, I mean, I can start, but please jump in. Um, so, you know, one of the most amazing things for me is like, you know, we filmed the, the documentary in Puka Puka, but most Puka Pukans live in the diaspora. So, you know, to me, when we went to New Zealand and that was completely intentional and I just saw the reaction of the people, of the Puka Pukan people and the Cook Islanders and um, in New Zealand, that was just very moving, you know, 
even even youth that have never been to Puka Puka, but whose parents had been and they have not been able to go back or ever even seen. So that is one uh, very emotional reaction of people really um, being able to see a place that they love and they long for. Um, and that is incredible to me as a filmmaker. Um, another thing that we, the film has also shown in an international conference um, um, with educators uh, still showing and we're getting feedback. We're very interested in taking the films into the schools and figure out how we could include it in the curriculum, you know, in what sections. I mean, I want the film to be seen as a filmmaker, but I think this film goes beyond that. And how can the film be used, you know, to really, not just to spread the message, but also um, to create some kind of change also in whatever communities the film is seen. So, um, you know, it's, uh, we did a screening of the film in, um, in Bolivia, you know, and people, there is a lot of connections. When people see the film, they are connected no matter, you know, where they are. So that to me is always very positive. But I, I think for me, I would like to hear from, you know, educators, you know, and from other organizations, NGOs, environmental agencies, indigenous rights organizations. I wanna use the film and this is how I'm gonna use it. We, can we do it? And I would say, yes, you know? So I just, um, that's what I hope that it will happen next, that the film will just be really valuable for other people to also, um, you know, not just promote, but to really spread their message um, on, on climate change and indigenous rights and, um, and conservation. And, um, and any others, just kind of what you've heard, the feedback that you've gotten as, as people um, involved in the film? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the friends, my friends and um, all want to go to Puka Puka after seeing <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I know, how do I get there? You know, uh, what do I take? What do I wear? Uh, do I have to walk bare feet all the time? You know. <laughs> and will you come with me? You know, I'll feel better if you come with me. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's just it's such a it's so foreign. <laughs> it's so far away. You know, I might never get back. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny, but um, yeah, um, um, many of my friends who've seen the movie uh, now understand a little bit somewhat of, you know, of, of why I am who I am, uh, because I, I haven't really changed much. <laughs> Is that good, Pio? <laughs> yeah, a lot of people are interested in there and they marvel at the... Um, at uh, the fact that um, <clears throat> the people still speak their language, they chant um, at, uh, at funerals. Um, there are many other things I talked to them about, uh, pleases them, you know, they please them and, and they can feel good that um, that part of the world, this dream world to many of the Westerners yeah. um, is still, still um, protected to some, to some extent, yes. From, uh, from destruction. <laughs> and, and Amelia? Um, yeah, the world red carpet premiere of the film was in Puka Puka, and Pio was there so he can speak to that. <laughs> and everyone's names, Hema made sure to include every single person living on the atoll's names in the credits, which was a lot of work. And so that everyone could see their names on the big screen. So I'm sorry we weren't there for that moment, but I'd love to hear from Pio. Overall, you know, mostly I'm, um, my experience has been with, you know, other Puka Pukans who are just so proud um, and so proud of their atoll and, you know, just seeing um, it on the big screen and it being valued. And most people in Cook Island said, oh my gosh, I had no idea, Puka Puka is so beautiful because traditional knowledge can sometimes be devalued. And um, there is that aspect, you know, kind of the fresh off the boat, the fob, the, oh, you're from the farm, you're a hick, you know? And so to elevate 
that knowledge and show it in such a beautiful poetic way really moved um, a lot of people, a lot of Pukapugans, myself included. And, and Mr. Pito, how did that red carpet uh, premiere go? <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, the, the reaction of the, especially the kids, the children, when they see themselves on, on the big screen, mm. that's just priceless. Mm. And um, mm. you can hear, you can hear a pin drop with everybody staring on the big screen. And, um, and with, it's almost like everybody at the same time when they see Funny, funny scenes, scenes to them. Everybody breaks out in laughter all at once, and that's the that's the enjoyment they're getting out of the seeing themselves with the with the film inside as characters in the film. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's it's quite amazing the response here. Um, And I tried to show, show it weeks after, keep showing because people would come up and let, let us see this again, let us see this again. And <laughs> that's what they, you know, they, they wanted to see themselves again. So okay. yeah, it was an ongoing thing for, for a few weeks there. Um, the reaction, the, the film, the, the collaboration between the, the scenery, and the uh, beautiful narratives. Um, I think my words, my initial reaction were hauntingly beautiful narrative that that went along with the with the actual footage of the film. Um, it's unbelievable. I think it's a it's a really good good thing. So I have yeah. a so, so yeah, I completely agree. In fact, actually, we have we now have some questions from the audience um, rolling in and can you know related to the to the haunting you know narrative form. Uh, Jack from Washington, uh, this is for you, Johnny. Uh, few people have your gifts as a writer, your father's encouragement, your radio experience, or your experience as a documentary subject. Still. Mm -hmm. How do we inspire younger generations to write about and share their stories and knowledge in written, oral, or visual form? Um, I think contact with, um, you know, the family, mother, father, the beginning to begin uh, from the very small age uh, is very important in talking about things that could be mythical or it could be real. Uh, it's also very important. And then reading to them uh, um, stories from, um, uh, well, my father, we, um, they are reading um, stories, children and explaining um, clearly um, what further what the writing has been, where the, uh, what the writing um, is, has said, uh, described. Uh, that, that's important and also, um, Going out in the bush, you know, going out, if there's a reef, go on the reef, you know, and walk at low tide and, and pick up an, um, a sea slug and turn a, a sea urchin over. Just lots of experiences, lots and lots of different experiences with nature. With nature. That's very important. And people too, of course. And have, have kids, your friends, have their friends come to the house. And, and see you and in your home uh, and make it um, comfortable too, not just to come and sit and, and you know, a little, a little afraid of to do something, to touch something. It's a lot, lots and lots of things, but there has to be that action all the time, you know, not just feel that you read to the kids at nighttime and that's it, you've done, you've done your, your bit to have their mind expand and their heart pounding, you know, that's about. And my father was very, very good, very, very good. You know, we are going on to the reef and then diving through a big wave into the ocean. So you have the 
big waves between you and, and the land and the reef. All those things, they were all very exciting and disturbing in a way, but <laughs> it also, you also learn courage. So that when you do write, you know, you, you're not afraid to describe certain things that are not normally written about. The, uh, so, yeah, yeah, just so activities, 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 yeah, very important. Get out there and do things. Get out there and do a whole bunch of different yeah, things, yeah. different ways and shapes and yeah. forms. Yeah. So, oh yeah. And that way, mm -hmm. that way you can build up a, a suite of stories to tell. <laughs> yeah, my father, we started very young when, uh, when we could barely swim. We used to hang on to his back, shoulders, and then he would swim very difficult so, uh, from one coral to another in the lagoon. And then he would... Uh, we would disembark from his back and walk around and, you know, and, uh, and to see what we could find there. Yeah. So, those are memories. Great. Well, <laughs> and those things, uh, uh, contact with parents and um, and dear friends um, is is so important. Yeah, because it comes back to you all the time as you as you age. You know, they're precious, mm -hmm. very precious. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That was wonderful. Um, Simon from Melbourne um, has asks uh, an important message of the film is in regards to food security and not being greedy. So, you know, as I remember, you take what one per one for each adult and a little one for for uh, for a child. <laughs> so not eating too much, not wasting food. Do the panelists, do you all think this may be a message relevant to city? communities who are likely the biggest contributors to climate change. This, this idea of food security not being greedy. <laughs> I think Pio should answer this one. And I'll just say, <laughs> yes, absolutely. The ideas of conservation carry over to city life. Honolulu, where I am, is pretty urban. And we have a coconut crab in the Honolulu Zoo. Whereas in Puka Puka, the coconut crabs are left to replenish and har harvested and then you know, given out to the villages. Um, so that model of conserving so that you can eat tomorrow and knowing where your food comes from, I think also in urban settings, um, there's that urban farm movement, but just knowing where our food comes from and gets back to that idea of connection, connection to our food source. And then when we're connected to our food source, we can be more secure with it and know about conserving it and sharing it out. You know, if I'm growing all these avocados and, you know, they're coming all at once, so I'm going to give them to neighbors and they're going to trade me for something else. And so connecting to our food source and urban environments, sharing, uh, conserving and of course, yeah, not being greedy, but I'd love to hear from Pio too. Mr. Pio? Thank, thank you for that, um, uh, Food security is part of our tradition. It's all engraved in our, in our uh, traditional ways. Um, nobody over harvests, which is a uh, waste of food. There's no such thing as waste of food on our island. There's no su such thing as greedy because everybody uh, basically, as a, commun as a communal society, we, we harvest for what we need and, and conserve the rest. Um, that's right across the board. It's including the kavu, birds, fish, um, subsistent living. Is, a, is I think that uh, it is part of that part parcel of that lifestyle. Um, things like uh, the business. These food reserves for business. Uh, it's a foreign idea. It's a foreign concept. Um, <laughs> so you don't. So you won't find any big businesses. Let's say you won't find any big businesses in football. 
Because everybody, everybody owns everything as a community. And when people uh, harvest food, it's basically for everybody, not just for you and your own immediate family. There's no such thing. You share those amongst family, friends, and neighbors. That's how, that is how we live. And that is uh, also allows everybody to be concerned about uh, food security. When you see somebody, if you think they're wasting food, you say so and stop them from doing it. Like the children learn that from the adults. Mm. That behavior, it becomes a behavioral thing. When children see the adults uh, behaving the same thing, they, they of course learn it. So you do learn it from generation to generation. You don't mm. lose that uh, aspect of part of our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And and considering you know that that food security is such a and uh, part of your lifestyle, you know how and I it, this is talked about a little bit in the film, but how does um, how is sea level rise really affecting that for you all, uh, the land and and just generally speaking, even you know the ocean as well. And I'm going to ask you again, Mr. Pio. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to well, we can see that. nowadays uh, with with the increase. Of level sorry yeah we we can see nowadays with the increase of sea levels mm -hmm. uh and we can see areas of land where the sea are uh, overcoming taking the, the land and um what we can do what we can do about it we really don't know we just have to try and mitigate around the, the the fact that it's coming, this this is climate change happening. Mm -hmm. um, uh, hopefully, we can. I would suggest we're going to adapt accordingly to what uh, what is happening with climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to be resilient about it. Uh, our traditions may change. How much of that depends on. How severe the climate change becomes, mm -hmm. as 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 probably uh, the, the film and the narrative in the film says, what's going to happen to Bukopua? Mm -hmm. Will we go under the waves? Those things come in the mind of the people, and, and I suppose not just for Bukopua, but for those people in the in the whole wide world being affected by climate change. Uh, it's all. Mm -hmm. It's all, uh, it's all in everybody's mind, the risks that are happening and how resilient the people have to be to overcome this problem of climate change. It's not just unique to Pukopua, it's global. And I think uh, part of the attraction with a lot of people with this, with this particular film is that message mm -hmm. of uh, the effects of climate change. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's, it's something that so many people will be able to, to connect with around the world. And I, you know, Hema, they, you know, one of the things that you mentioned in one of your comments earlier was, you know, your, your wish that this, that this film triggers um, someone to take action, you know, take a conservation pledge or do something in a local community. Um, you know, can you kind of expand on that a little bit or? Um, Well, well, we, or well we can, yes, I'm not sure of exactly <laughs> what we can do. Um, well, I'll, I'll say. To to... Uh, let me, let me just jump in and Amelia, you can follow. There's a bit of a delay with Mr. Pio. <laughs> so, but, um, We'll we'll go with Hema first, and then we'll and then we'll go with Amelia, and and Mr. Peel will wrap us up. <laughs> you know, as a filmmaker, every film is different, and I do feel like um, because this film um, is documenting a, a unique place in the world that has not been documented before, and it's very specific to this culture, right? Like you might be like, oh, you watch a film, and you might be like, well, but I'm not in a communal society, you know. So we just thought like. What can we do so you could do something about it? And Pio just said it, you know? Pio just said like, what action can you do to create an impact? 
Mm. It could be like, hey, if you see your your kids wasting food or the parents are wasting food, just to, you know, take an action to correct that, you know. So I think the idea of the conservation pledge could be really helpful to really that's what we're trying to do now to create it. So then we could the conservation pledge, the lesson plan, and a discussion guide can accompany the film and can create a conversation. And then whoever is watching it, even if you're in Brooklyn or if you are like in, in Australia or whatever you are, that you watch the film and you are like, okay, what action can I do so I can change my behavior a little bit, you know? So for me as a filmmaker, it's like the film is there. Let's hope that we can create these tools and then let's hope that whatever the film goes, you know, it could be accompanied by an action that will, uh, produce, you know, um, you know, just a, a change in, in people's minds, hopefully, you know, so that to me, I, I mean, feel free to jump in. That is, in this case, the idea of the, of, uh, of the conservation pledge can be really helpful because maybe you will watch the film and you are surrounded, you are in an urban setting, but there's always something that you can do. You could always take full responsibility. Absolutely. And, um, what I would like people to do is like, what can I do? I wanted to say also like, I'm not really concerned that the film will change Puka Puka because I know you in Puka Puka, you're so rock solid <laughs> in terms of like who you, you know who you are. Um, so, but uh, if the film can produce any benefit, any benefit for Puka Puka, for the Puka Puka people, that's, they will make that call. What is it that they want, you know? Uh, what, what is it that could benefit them, you know, to their own culture, but um, I don't know if I answered the question, but that's what comes to my mind. And um, Amelia, I don't know if you have something else to add. I was just going to add, speaking to the question that came from Melbourne about what you can do in urban environments. Mm -hmm. So in terms of a conservation pledge and, you know, connecting to youth, more than just like riding your bicycle and buying a hybrid car and those sorts of things, you know, really, to me, it's about connection and helping youth connect to their food source, you know, that you know, eating, eating only local um, and knowing who your fisherman is. You know, Johnny's taught me a lot here in on Oahu, which is quite an urban environment. She has special trees that she talks to and um, she's, you know, at 80 something climbs the avocados and, you know, it's like, communing oh. with them and shares them out and you know has palm trees down on Waikiki Beach that are her special trees and that level of connection is something that she's taken from Puka Puka with her into a more urban environment and that kind of deep connection to our food and our food sources and our natural environment is something that I hope um, we can help help inspire. That's wonderful. And well, you know, as, as we were coming, we're basically at the hour, but before I, before I end, I, I want to um, first kind of, as we look to the future and we look at the youth and to maintain that connection, we must always remember and respect the elders and, and those of our past. And so with that in mind, I want to recognize um, the recent passing of, of Johnny's um, rather handsome, since I just saw him in a picture, <laughs> uh, brother Charlie, Papa Charlie, and um, convey our, you know, our deepest condolences. And um, you know, from what, from what uh, uh, Hemas told me, he was a very vibrant uh, young man uh, and maintained a, a really powerful light force throughout his, his, uh, his, his years. So just wanna kind of convey our, our condolences for that. Um, and uh, with that, I want to thank you all for joining for joining this this Q and A, and for and to our audience, um, uh, thank you for joining and, and and viewing the film. And we hope that you share it far, far and wide, and continue this this conversation of of fostering connection uh, with the land and and into the future amongst the young people, amongst the people my age and older, and just you know up and down around the world uh, to to maintain that connection. So. Thank you, everyone. You to you. Atawai Wolo. Kaveatu Terogite, say Putanapo.